What's up, Shiloh? I'm excited for you guys to meet my buddy Bryce and Isom. He jumped on at the studio there in Wickenburg. Uh, we kind of walked through the history, how we got to know each other. Bryson is one of those people that is just sneaky smart. Um, one of the things I feel really tasked with is making the gospel available in a way that we can digest, that we can metabolize and put into practice. There's a lot of places where, at, at a personal level, I have weaknesses as a pastor. But one of the areas that I'm the most passionate about is good education, usable education, something you can take with you, put into practice, see God at work in your life throughout the week. This is Bryson. You're going to love it. He's a great guy. He's a pastor of Relentless in Phoenix, Relentless Church, Phoenix, Arizona. Cannot tell him how much I appreciate him jumping on. You guys are going to love him. Here we go. It's like <laughs> close. I'm going to end up going whack because yeah, I talk with my I'll try to make it formal and I'll church it up. Do you Dude. know me at all? So Hello, funny. brother Steve. Welcome to my welcome podcast. Welcome to yeah. Like, Hi, oh, man, welcome to my here. YouTube page. There's got to be more. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what? You know, if I may. Okay, we are here with Bryson. Bryson, uh, we met. Here we are at a digital uh, sort of a rollout at Shiloh. You and I met uh, through social media. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll tell you my part of it, and I want to hear your part of sure. it. Sure. I was going through a weird time. I'm not a good mentor. <laughs> and that, that drives some people nuts. Like that really bothers some people. And uh -huh. you know, as a pastor, that's supposed to be sort of baked in. And so I've been going through this kind of a shaming from a few people. Of like, you know, you need to be a better mentor. And I'm like, I, it's like, it's like asking an ostrich to fly. You know, mm -hmm. maybe like there's things I can do, but that's just, I'm just not good at it. And I remember, if you remember the story, I remember I was praying and I was like, God, if I'm supposed to like talk to someone, it was literally that foreign of a thought. If I was supposed to like talk to someone, like, can you just help me to understand what that would look like? And I get a, uh, a message on Instagram, take it from there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I don't even know if this was a sponsored post. I don't, I don't know if you guys were trying to do ads or anything like that. Uh, I came across one of, uh, just one of those clips. You guys are, you guys have been putting those out, um, a lot. And, uh, I man, I just stumbled on one on online one day and I was like, who's this guy? Um, Okay, he's got a good message, um, and I just kept following him. Just and then, and then I started stalking. Right, you go from preview. Once you admit it, then it's not stalking. Yeah, I know it's, it's, <laughs> it's legal. If you say it, then it's legal. <laughs> yeah. So I, I kind of went from previewing it, um, like okay, to to stalking, and um, and then I, I just reached out and I and I just simply wanted to say thank you, like thank you for putting out uh, great content, and um, and I was really really moved. Um, uh, uh, by some of the things you were saying, I don't even remember what it was back then, uh, which which message it was or whatever. But I was just like, "Hey man, thanks for thanks for this." You were trying to like keep it like real civil, like, "Hey man, thanks." And I, I, me going through, I'm like, "We have to talk." I don't know what's going on, but I remember I called and I was like, "I know this probably seems weird, but like, I literally just finished saying like, I don't know, like." Typically, what we do is so different mm -hmm. that we don't have pastors reach out ever. Like, it's not like I've got like this group of pastors that I stay friends with or anything like that. I'm not against it, but right. um, it was it was it was a meaningful thing in my life of God being like, "Hey, I like I'm still the one, you know, I'm the one pulling all the strings here, you know." Mm -hmm. And um, what I remember about our conversation is just kind of both of us going like, "Something could be different. We this could be done different. Mm -hmm. This is the the burnout." maybe i don't know if that's kind of a it's kind of a dramatic word but like it feels like that what we're doing the way that we're doing it isn't sustainable and um just to hear someone else going through that that shared experience you uh -huh. know and and you know you and i are both in the same profession but i would say that anybody in the world can understand that moment where somebody comes along and goes i've lived that experience or i'm living that experience also yeah uh maybe we should be like be friends and that's uh as guys i don't think you're like we're not really prone to admitting that. No, and, and the way that I, I've been thinking about it is like it really was that timely bigger brother presence for me. Um, and I still remember the first time that you actually came down and showed up at a service. Um, and did which, I tell you what, I was coming? Do I, I don't remember. I feel like I didn't. I feel like we maybe got off did. a flight or something. I don't remember. I think it was like it kind of felt like it was like, yeah, I'd love to come to a service sometime. And then you like showed up, and I, <laughs> and I was like, oh, dude, Jordan's here. This is this is amazing. What what do I say? What do I do? Um, what do I do with my hands? Like I, I, I was like, I don't know what to do. And man, Jordan is way less impressive in person. I really, I, <laughs> he's I way <laughs> taller in person than That's I thought. So overrated. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget after the service, man. You were super encouraging. And, um, it, but you said something, I don't even know if you remember saying this, you're like, man, he's like, you basically said, I don't know how, if you keep doing this, like, I don't know how you're going to last. 
And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, man, just all of the energy and service and all of the energy of preaching and all of you like ping pong and around meeting everybody's. And I was like, you know what? That's exactly how I feel. Yeah. Um, and I don't even, like I said, I don't know that if you remember saying that at all. Yeah. And I just no, remember I like there's, there's something here that this guy has that I need to find out more of, like more mm -hmm. of the story, what's going on. And that honestly just kind of kicked off everything from the mentor aspect, I would say, uh, for me anyway, maybe, maybe you felt different about it, but I was like, this guy's got something he's, he's been down the road before. Let me read something real quick. Uh, if you're at home, if you're listening, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter two. This is actually your stuff. We're, we're preaching Bryson's stuff this week. So thank you. Slightly less research and digging that I got to do this week. <laughs> sure. Ephesians chapter two, verse one, we're going to go with one through 10. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were nature deserving. We were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ, seated us with Him in heavenly realms of Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Um, when I when I hear that, let me tell you what I hear, and then I know that you've had a chance to look at it a little bit deeper. I'm curious your thoughts, but um, I used to think of lost in transgression, lost in the sin nature as being you were naughty. Mm. And I think it actually kind of says it as like you were kind of naughty, and, mm -hmm. and now, you know, God, through his correction and discipline, he's making you slightly less naughty. And, right. You know, if it all goes well, we're going we're gonna to gather up once a week. We're gonna get around a group of other not naughty people. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll like display our not naughtiness, right? And then, I guess that's it. Yeah. And for me, based on that conversation that we had that day, actually at your church, where you, you like you remember the cartoons when Bugs Bunny was like playing the drums, playing the trumpet, playing the harmonica, playing the flute with he's playing guitar with his toes, like he's carrying the whole band. Uh huh. I think I think what I am stepping into my five year goal is to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Five years from now, what I want to do, I want to be healthy on the inside. I want to be healthy on the outside. That's what I want. I don't know what the circumstances will be around that, but that's my goal. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes you can even get lost in your goodness. Yeah. Trying so hard to earn it or deserve it or mm -hmm. be the most good or the, be the least naughty. And I think in my season right now, what I'm, what I feel God taking me through is like, don't just set down the badness because that's cheap. The world will celebrate that. The world will tell you you're doing a good job but set down the goodness that's motivated in striving. Right. You know, take the striving that you feel is how you qualify yourself and even set that down and learn to just sort of be bare in front of God and go, I'm not, I'm not bringing anything to the table. I'm trying really hard mm -hmm. because I want to do a good job, but my goodness is not what gets me your grace. So... Based on our conversation, like I'm drawing a lot of comparisons, and I would like for people who are who are maybe listening in to to hear your thoughts. I kind of feel like I know them, but mm -hmm. don't don't you feel like that's sort of the smell of what God's doing in the lives of His people right now? Is not just set down the badness because like 70s, 80s, 90s, it was like you sign this piece of paper and you're in youth group. Remember this? Right. You're like, do you promise not to have sex with your girlfriend? Yeah. You're like 14, and you're like, here's a piece of paper, and you're like, uh huh. Okay. I, I, and this is heaven, right? Getting uh -huh. in heaven. Yep. You do this. Yeah. And purity, you know, the choir, the fire and, and don't drink alcohol and don't stay out past 10 o'clock. You're like, oh, okay. You're like a 14 year old. You're like, okay. I guess, I guess and it was very, very holiness labeled, but very legalistic natured. Mm -hmm. I want you to jump in here. I feel like I don't want to just be my opinion, but it feels like God is starting to move things back towards like, don't just set down the badness. Set down why you're pursuing the goodness also and just find a place of, of rest. Yeah, I, I think that when I think of that passage, um, one of the things that there are a couple of things that come to mind, actually, um, uh, to your point. Um, the, the first thing that really pops off the page for me is what the gospel is and what the gospel is not. And um, I think many of us in our culture, I mean, you grew up as a pastor's kid. Um, I know that. And um, I didn't grow up in the church, um, but I got indoctrinated fairly young. And um, what the passage is saying is what the gospel is, what it's not. And what comes to my mind is that 
I think that many of us think that the gospel is God is good, uh, you're bad, try harder, we'll see you next Sunday. Um, and <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've ever felt that. It doesn't uh, feel like good news. No, no, not it at feels all. It's condemning. Yes. And it's like, oh my gosh, man. It almost feels like, um, did you ever play Little League at all? Oh, yeah. Okay, so literally, it's almost like um, the gospel is the coach just yelling at you, saying, you can do it. You can do it, buddy. You can do it, but don't blow this for me. Yeah, but also, yeah. Right. right. And I just, it's, it feels that way. And so you try hard. You try so hard uh, to get it right, to do the right things. And But there's one problem with that, and that's actually the Bible. Uh, I mean, because there, there are two primary illustrations that uh, the Word of God uses to talk about our righteous deeds and our good deeds. One's from one's in the Old Testament, one's in the New Testament. Um, the one in the Old Testament is Isaiah 64, verse 6, and that's where um, Isaiah says that our righteous deeds are a polluted garment, if you read the ESV. In the what e- does that actually mean? Right, you so, really dig down into that. <laughs> yeah. Do you, would you like to expound on a polluted garment? I, I, what, I would. Um, uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, after we shut the cameras yeah, off. Yeah, after, after we shut the cameras <laughs> off. I'll give you the... <laughs> the, 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 the point being, and I, I, I mean, we're at church, right? But the point being, it's not like it draws, Isaiah draws this picture of like, hey, you really tried. It is like, it is drawing the most human refuse, just, oh, the thing that we don't want to look at. Like, this is what it amounts to. And it draws draws a very distinct picture of like, hey, this thing that you're so proud of, mm-hmm. that you're parading around as though God is now going to owe you something, it is literally unimaginably repulsive. Yes. Oh, no, absolutely. We can uh, do the uh, the PG-13 version after the video. Um, but essentially, in Hebrew, it, it's a lap cloth. It's it's dirty underwear. And so could you imagine that? Like give it, like wrapping that up, putting it in a box, putting a bow on it, and just giving it to a friend? Yeah. And then being like, oh my gosh, like why would you give me like, that? Dude, I worked really hard on that. <laughs> I have a lot of effort and time in that. Like, it's so unappreciative. Yeah, I know. Let me see your, let me see your lap cloth. I would have lost a bet if you'd have said, hey, is this discussion of a lap cloth going to come up? I bet. I just can't see how that would happen. <laughs> but but it is, and the idea is not to encourage you to try even harder. Right. It's to show that it's a dead end of like, hey, pause. This isn't, this goes nowhere. This is a literal road to nowhere. So to try harder is absolutely useless. Yeah, and um, and so the, the so that's the Old Testament one, and we can talk more about it later. But uh, the one in the New Testament is the one that Paul uses in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 8. And at the beginning of 3, when he's talking about, if you remember, he's talking about like his laundry list of righteous things. He's like, man, if, if, if there's anyone that has room to boast, it's me. Like I was born um, out of the right family. Um, I was from the tribe of Benjamin. Right. I, um, as to the law, I was zealous. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. But then in verse 8, he basically says, it's all rubbish, man. It is all rubbish. Now, what is we don't, the word? What is the word? Rubbish. So we uh, we don't say uh, rubbish unless uh, maybe you're from the UK. Um, we we would. Say, I would. I would say maybe we should start because it, don't you feel smarter? When you're like, that's rubbish. That, <laughs> man, that guy is well educated. Right. Man, right. This guy's smart. Yeah, I, I stepped in rubbish earlier, but what it's <laughs> uh, it's it's slang for animal dung, and, and so we wouldn't say rubbish, but we would say it's it's bull, and then the Greek word is uh, skubulon. It's BS. Right. That, that's what it is. It's, it's bull skubulon. And what's interesting is like what maybe you've noticed is, is like religious people. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we like to compare our skubulon. Uh, it's like, well, yeah. look at mine. It's stacked right. so, you know, so high. And the other, mm-hmm. some guys like, well, look at mine. It's a mocha colored. Um, it's like, <laughs> it's all skubulon, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's all BS. Again, again, shocking language used intentionally to draw you away from it, not to draw you through it into more of it. It is right. literally both uses is like, stop, mm-hmm. just stop. Yeah. And so it's all, it's all BS, man. And that's how God sees it. So here's an honest question. And I, this is why I like dialogues because I don't know what your answer is going to be on this one. <laughs> I feel like that for a period of my life coming out of the legalism, do good to be good. You do good things so that you can be good. And and then if two things, either you prove that you can't and you feel like a loser or you think that you did and you feel entitled. Mm-hmm. Either way, either way, it leaves you with nothing. I mean, it is like it is like a, a roundabout that you just can't get off of. And it's yeah. like it never leads anywhere good. And I probably erred a little on the side of taking advantage of grace and with the right heart. I mean, listen, I'm not I'm not like a um like a manners proper formal personality. I'm just not. But I think I probably overcorrected a little bit into the like I needed to 
a season to recover mm. because I was so ingrained. I was so entrenched in that. And so if somebody's listening, going, so like what I do doesn't matter. Like I can just do whatever I want. Yeah. Uh, well, why wouldn't I just do whatever I feel like in the moment? Mm. I know what my thoughts are. What would you say to somebody that's like maybe in the process of overcorrecting out of legalism into that mercy uh, orbit? Yeah, man. So from my story, it was um, I came from a very um, legalistic culture uh, and wanted nothing to do with it. Right. And this is before growing up in church and uh, the whole idea because I didn't grow up in church. But um, and so but when I got into it, I thought it was the game that you played was was being religious and and doing the right things and getting um the 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 points. trophies and the badges yeah. and the points and all those things and um and then and then I, and then I kind of swung back the other way I was like oh there is grace this is grace I can do whatever I want there's um, no rules do you remember that pizza commercial where they say there's no rules and he takes his shirt off and he's like <laughs> there's no rules he takes his shirt off she's like put your shirt on he's like there's one rule as he's finished like yeah, overcorrects and comes back to the middle yeah I think everybody goes through that I think everybody yeah. that goes this sounds more like Jesus the grace and the mercy thing I think everybody does overcorrect for a period a yeah. little bit yeah and I I think the problem is that because the reality is you've said this, I've said this. Sin is fun. Um, it it it, re- it, it is. I mean, let me pause, let me let me stop right there because I think people feel like that's a risky thing to say. Sure. Except for people who are just like full on in their in their sin nature right now. Right. It's like everybody outside the world will say it, mm-hmm. but in church we're not supposed to admit that. Right. And so for you, I I feel like that's got to be an empowering moment to acknowledge like no, it's we're drawn to it. Mm-hmm. We're drawn to our sin nature. Even after salvation, there are, there are lanes of sin mm-hmm. that are never going to sting to me the way the other sins sting. And we all have our own little things that we maybe harbor and then condemn. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so I, I think that's a brave statement to say that sin is sin is fun and it doesn't instantly um, pay off. Right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes sin is something that goes on for a while and you're like, I think I'm in the clear. I think we're good. And so I hope that helps somebody that's listening to it. I mean, here we are at a church saying like, no, we, we get it. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a, a healthy relationship with the attraction of sin, not healthy relationship with sin, a healthy acknowledgement of like, Hey, if you're afraid to admit that you've got a sin issue, like this is a safe place to admit right. that. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just think that I, I don't want people to miss that. Right. No. And, and so I think the, the other side of that statement is it's fun, but it's, it's not free, right? Um, you're not free. I'm not free. We're still bound. And, and Jesus came to set us free. And so I just think maybe it's I don't fun, know. If you, it's fun, but it's not free would be a good thing for people to circle in their notes. Right. Like fun, but not free. I mean, it's, I don't know. Have you noticed that? Like, I mean, even in your wild days, right? Jordan Weaver's I didn't have any. <laughs> In your in your wild did did you ever know? Uh, yeah, it's fun. I see that. But could you speak to maybe like how did you not feel free? So um, I this coming off of just eating a double quarter pounder from McDonald's <laughs> five minutes ago, <laughs> I would compare it. There are there are elements or stages of sin that the effect is immediate. Mm. Like if you drink too much the night before to excess, and you wake up the next day with a hangover. You can measure the hangover. What you can't measure is maybe the dependency that's developing, mm-hmm. right? I can eat a Big Mac and be completely honest in saying, like, I feel great right now because I only ate one. Mm-hmm. I could then draw the conclusion of, like, I had, a, I had a Big Mac. I feel fine. Therefore, what's the big deal? So then what happens is I, I can resist what I've been told is true, and I start to develop a habit based on short-term comfort that creates long-term suffering. And this isn't just a Christian concept. I think this is anything. It is so easy to convince yourself that the short-term uh, salve or, you know, you can anesthetize life's problems. Hmm. And then by not dealing with them, they continually get worse. So I go back in my life and like, it was never the day of the issue. It was the months or the weeks that developed into patterns that caused the damage. Hmm. So, so if somebody were to go like, um, Hey, I, I just don't see why this is bad. Did you have, you, have you read Mere Christianity recently? Not, not in a while. Okay, so I just reread it. 
highly recommended. Mm. But he talks about the ship, a, a fleet of ships, and he said that we think that as long as we're, we think of our, we're the ship, right? We're the ship and we're on this journey. And as long as we're not bumping into other boats, mm. then we're fine. Mm. Like that's how we gauge morality. We gauge goodness on whether we're sinking other people's boats. Mm. And we're not. We're just on the sea. We're like, okay, then we must be okay. He goes, but what about the seaworthiness of that boat? What about the condition of that boat? Because if we're doing things that weaken the seaworthiness of that boat, we're actually decreasing that boat's viability for long-term mission, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just, are we bumping into other boats? Are we taking care of ourselves? And the third one is, who owns the boats? Have we been sent to a certain location? Are we on track for what we were created to do? And I think that morality gets missed a lot on that third one. Of like, like I said, my five-year goal is to be a healthier person. Mm -hmm. I want to get healthy on the inside and on the outside. And and I'm still clarifying what that's going to mean for, for me and for my family. But <clears throat> I don't want to lose track of the fact that I am owned by a creator. I was built for a purpose. And when he sets me free, he sets me free to pursue with my whole heart something that's going to be the most fulfilling. Mm. So I think sometimes when we view sin in moments, we miss the magnitude. Does that make sense? Yeah. This like God's going through this big lifetime transformation. I've started getting up. Perfect example. I've started getting up and doing push-ups in the morning. Right you now. Have. Right now, you can't tell a bit of difference. And I've been at it for a while. I'm sore. My body hurts more. <laughs> I don't look any different. Right. right. So in a moment, you miss the magnitude. The magnitude is what I do over a period of time. Uh -huh. What I do in a moment is actually like a check mark. It goes down before it starts to come back up. Uh -huh. And and so it that's a very long answer, but I think that's where I go to like, okay, I have a, I have a really dishonest relationship with sin mm. because I don't want people to see it. Uh, I don't want to admit that it's fun, but I also don't realize the long-term damage that it creates. So I don't think that we have ever stopped and sat down and had a real open, honest, I don't say ever, but recently in my mind, the church hasn't sat down and had a real open, honest discussion about what a sin nature is or does. Man, that's such a good word. Um, I'm going to have to go back and read uh, C.S. Lewis's book. Dude, I'm telling you what. That, that to me, helps me categorize my life of like, okay, I'm not doing any damage to anybody else. Well, that's great. I mean, that's a great start, but that's universally sort of accepted of like, well, if you're not doing any damage, you must be good. Actually, you're in. You're probably going to go to heaven now. And it's like, no, no, no. Even though we understand that morality on, on, a, on a singular level, there's a... I won't say names, but there's a there's a pastor. I heard this story, and I'm just going to – I say this with no judgment, knowing people are going to hear the judgment in it, that I intend not to be there, and this is going to ruffle some feathers. So, listen, I'm looking right in the camera. I want you to hear me say, I am sorry if this upsets you. I genuinely am. It just draws such a good point of internal health of the boat. Like, I'm not taking anybody else out, but, like, if my boat's in disarray, I'm still not as useful, and especially if I'm not on mission, right? There's this pastor, and he went to England or the U.K. or somewhere to go meet this famous minister or author or writer or something, and – and I don't remember who he's going to meet, but he gets over there and the guy's smoking a cigar. And, in, you know, here we are, this American version of Christianity and very American version of morals. And, you know, and he goes, I, I, I got to be honest, I guess I'm just really surprised to see you smoking a cigar. And he said, the guy, this famous minister that's just had this giant impact for the king, takes a cigar out of his mouth. He goes, you're fat. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's like, y y we're so... We're so in tune with causing damage to other people, but we let ourselves off the hook if we're only damaging ourselves. Mm. Because when we damage ourselves, we decrease the effectiveness of the mission that we're called to. So what it does, here's what I hope people get out of that. I hope everybody that's upset with me for saying that will hear this. The encouragement is to take care of yourself also, that you matter, like your life matters in this. And let's not categorize I mean, for years, you could name the top three sins in the church. I mean, we've had these favorite sins that we pick on, and it's like, hey, 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 are we causing damage to each other? Are we causing damage to ourselves? But also, when those two things are in place, are we remaining on mission? Are we actually being transformed to go make an impact for the kingdom, for a creator that made us to, to live outside of our limitations? I, I think that when it comes to this topic, too, I think that that last thing that you mentioned is probably the most um, misrepresented, um, that there's a, a mission to be on. Um, why do you think that that is like, what like, is that? Is that our fault? Like as pastors, Bryson, this is uh, my podcast. So I'm going to be the one asking all the <laughs> questions here. I feel like I've done all the talking. Sure. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I, I think it's, I think that sin at its core is a desire to be God and you'll never see it in the beginning. 
No one ever says, I want to be God mm -hmm. in the beginning. But greed is like a little bite of a desire to be God, a little too much control. That's why giving is such a, a woven in narrative of what it means to be in, a, in the kingdom is that we're giving away, trusting that the power is beyond our control. And I think greed is that. I think uh, sexual immorality, I think that indulgences, addiction is to try to take it all in under ourselves. If given full reign, there's a, I keep going back to this quote and I, it, it amazes me that, that this isn't an easier uh, quote to metabolize or to digest, but I, I haven't gotten a lot of good feedback on it. But Nietzsche said, verily I laugh at those who think themselves good because they have no teeth. Meaning they think they're good because they don't have the opportunity to be bad. Like they're not in a powerful position. Of course, you're not taking advantage of the poor. You are poor. Of course, you're not doing this. You don't have the opportunity to do that. And until you're in a position to see it played out, I think we would be very surprised to find out what's at the root of our own heart. I think we really would. I think at the end of the day, we don't want to believe that we're on mission for God. I think we want to believe that God's riding along on our boat with us. And that's a fundamental behavior shifting dynamic that it's like we will we'll hyper focus on the first one. Maybe we'll reference the second one and just completely ride off the third one and think we're gonna skate and, and get through life. So in your, I mean, in your, in your mind, cause you pastor, your, your church is such a unique place. It's mm -hmm. young people. It is your, your thick spots are, are thin spots. Like your admin is super, super high. And we're working on that. Shout out Katie and Kyle leadership team. Like we got some people going to work on those specific things and we've used some of your stuff. Um, but you're, you see a different group than the group I see. We're very rural or like our, our digital thing is a big deal. Do you think that even in the differences in our in our demographics, do you think that that's true of the third, which is staying on mission? So this is just an observation, and um, and I'm not an expert by any means. It's just an anecdotal observation. Um, uh, what I've noticed about, so I am a millennial. Uh, I hate that word, by the way. It drives me nuts. Well, how old are you? Uh, 35. Yep. So um, I think I, what what's the date? We'll I don't know. I think it's 80. It doesn't matter. Sorry, Whatever. Keep going. You're a yeah. millennial. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what I've noticed is like what um, what's on the other side of what people are striving for. So for the this younger generation, um, the ones that we ministered, uh, young adults, young professionals, young families, um, we, we just seem to be in this season and have been, um, and it's really indicative of, of this group. Um, I don't want to put everybody in this box, but they are very cause-oriented. Yeah. Um, so I think it, the temptation, or maybe not the temptation, the reality is it's just easier for them to be on mission because mm -hmm. that's how they're they're more wired. And, yeah. and maybe for uh, the other uh, other boxes that are out there, the the, the different generational boxes, um, I think that there is some level of more security. Um, golly, you said something when you came and preached to us about uh, just the unlimited, reckless ability of, of youthfulness. Yeah. Um, and that struck a chord with me. I was like, that is exactly what it is. And so right. they're willing to go for the cause or the mission or whatever. So that's, um, probably not going to be their temptation, um, to, to not be, to not do that. I'm, I'm surprised in a good way. I think there's a lot of good that comes with it, but the social causes and the so social justice where it ranks on our young people's radars, um, so, so that I, I like to hear you say that, like that may, maybe mission is the thing that's going to be okay. So then again, again, young people, if you're listening, if the boat captain, the person that owns the ship, the fleet of ships says, I need you to go to India and they go, well, we want to go to China. Mm -hmm. Whether you miss it because you believe in the cause or whether you miss it out of just blatant disobedience, is there a difference? Mm. Or if you miss it, you miss it because... Um, a cause driven generation can still miss it if they pick the wrong cause. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you introduce that thought to somebody who's like, I want my life to matter. I want it to be meaningful. I want to accomplish something. I want to be that kernel of wheat that breaks open and becomes something bigger. Um, it's almost more, maybe, maybe it's almost more important for that generation to have clarity on what the mission is because they've already stated it's a value. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a, that's an interesting, I haven't really, haven't really thought of it in that direction, but that makes sense that if they're already mission minded, point them in a direction. So what do you do? What do you do? 
Right. So the uh, it's so much uh, to go back to the idea of the captain in the boat that you just brought up. Um, it's it's not so much saying this mission is better than this mission. I think it's saying um, who who's your captain? Who, who who is your lord? Because wherever you are is your mission. You know that. Mm-hmm. I know that. Yeah. Um, and then and then go with that great passion and that zeal um, under the direction and under the authority of of that captain uh, yeah. of, of the one who owns the boat right. um, and then, and then go um, because it's, it's, it goes back to the, my kingdom, his kingdom conversation. Right. Like, right. am I, am I doing this for my kingdom to build my reputation, to build my resume, to build whatever, it's whatever. Just, it's just religion repackaged. And right. Goodness for. A oh yeah. Owed, yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, who's in charge? Who's driving the boat? Um, and, and then go, because I think it goes back to like God's will, like the God's will's questions that we get and like the fear of, am I in God's will? Am I outside of God's will? It's like, good grief, man. I remember those years. I think that's what I think. I think that legalism drives that conversation Mm -hmm. because it's so getting it right oriented. Everything Mm -hmm. orients itself to proper performance. Yes. Doing it right. Mm-hmm. Am I doing it right? Mm-hmm. If, the, if the whole focus is doing it right, the inevitable the question would be, am I doing it right? Right. Well, and one of the things that I think about, and my counselor actually told me this. It was a fantastic uh, illustration. He said, God's will is a big backyard, and there's tons of toys in the backyard. Um, just go pick one. You got to remember whose house you're in. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, it's like, that's so good. Because I struggled. Maybe you struggle with it too. It's like, okay, God's will is ministry. God's will is um, yeah. putting on the pastor's hat and wearing that. Um, it's like, well, no, that's not. It's right. not just that, right? And it, and it gets and it gets into calling. Like God's calling on my life is this, right. and, then, and then you've probably experienced this. I have. I've had friends that just get locked in on that idea of calling. This is my calling, and then like when it doesn't pan out or it doesn't go well, they cling to it unnecessarily. Yeah, they go down with it. Yeah. So uh, Jamie Winship one time said that you have to understand the difference between identity and role. Mm. Because like if you were to go, my identity is that I'm a dad. Well, the problem is being a dad is a role, not an identity. And if I don't understand that, then I'm drawing my identity from my children instead of bringing my identity to my children. Mm. And then if you can draw the distinction between identity and role, and that's been hugely helpful for me because what you're saying is my calling. Well, like, wait a minute. What you're saying is your identity. If you know your identity, then no matter where you go, which toy you're playing with, you never forget your name, right? You're not like train conductor over here. You're mm-hmm. not like slide person over here. You're like, no, I know I know who I am, and I'm on the slide, or I'm playing with the train, or I'm playing with the dog, but I know who I am. Mm-hmm. And I think that missions will gradually change over time. Like I'm in this weird life transition right now, and I'm trying to cling to that identity that as things are changing and shifting and taking a new shape right now, it's kind of a lifeline. It's a survival technique because I see people and I know that you do too. And I'm the most this way. I'm the most this way when I try to pursue security Mm. because when I try to pursue security versus freedom, then I try to think of like, okay, what would someone in my position do Mm -hmm. versus what do I feel called to do? What do I believe God called me to do, even if that draws me out of security for a season? Because I would rather find it out there. And you see this, pastors that get lost in the church machine, mm-hmm. and then they get old, and they forgot how to speak the language. They forgot what the world looks like outside. They're so lost in the church machine that it's like the church then, what happens to the church? It, I mean, it has no longer has any connection to the world. Mm-mm. So how do you do that? How do you, I mean, how do you, you are 35. That's way too young to be a lead pastor. Someone mm-hmm. should have told you that. Um, <laughs> so what do you do at 35? You got young kids. I mean, I know that just from knowing you, your heart is to be, I guess, full, healthy, whole person, to be mm-hmm. a husband, to be a dad. I mean, what's your, what's your balancing act look like right now in this season? Not what will it look like, but in this season, what does your balancing act look like? Yeah, so uh, in regards to... Um, identity and and just that conversation in general, not doing a great job at it. Right. Um, it's, it's really, really hard. Did you, did you just admit publicly that you are in a season of struggling? Yes, I did. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah, I I know. I'm I'm sorry. I'm (laughs) just keep going. I might might be the worst guest you've ever had. Um, 
Uh, it's hard, man. It yeah. really, really is hard to, um, because you, you can flip the identity and the role thing like Jamie Winship was talking about so easily. And it's so hard to, to remember who you are. I, I heard somebody say uh, this one time, um, they were getting out of ministry and they, and uh, the question was asked, like, well, what are you looking forward to the most um, now that you're retiring or getting out? And he said, getting to know Jesus. Yeah. And, oh, man, that got me. I'm going to cry through this. I can tell you already because I just I love him so much. But I've got a friend of mine that called me one day just completely out of the blue, completely out of the blue. And we talked for maybe three minutes. And it will always it, it will go down – in my life is one of the most meaningful three minutes of my life. He had pastored and then he got called into other stuff and he calls me one day and he said, I got to, I got to tell you something, but let me finish where I'm going with this before you make a, a judgment. He said, I set my Bible down for three years and didn't pick it up. He said, I still love Jesus, but I know the basics of what's in there. You know, being a pastor, it's like your job to go study it. And he said, I felt led, which this goes against all sorts of my theology, right? I felt led to set my Bible down for three years. He said, I didn't pick it up. I can tell you exactly in my house where it's set. He said, I picked it up this morning and let me tell you what it said. And he goes through, and I mean, it's this like, rich, just beautiful revelation of like the, God's nature. And I mean, you know, when somebody just finds something and it just comes up like oil out of the ground. And so I'm listening. And he said, I want to tell you that someday... God may bring you to a season where you set down the work of picking up the word. And if it's an encouragement to you, just know that when you go back and you pick it back up, it'll be for you. It won't be for everybody else. Mm. Hey, I got to go. And I'm like, <sighs> and like, it was, it was a weird mix of like conviction because I know sometimes I go to the word and I'm like, can you just give me a sermon's worth? Mm -hmm. Can you give me just, just enough? And like the way that I preach, I know the way you preach too, is like, I'll, I'll put 60 or 70 hours into a sermon. Like I have no, no desire to stand up and be unprepared when I, when I preach. It's not that I want when people watch a sermon a third or fourth time, to be like, oh, I didn't catch that the first time. Like it's, it's a, it's just a hell of value. But I long, I long for that richness again, that says, God, what, what, there's a way to misinterpret what I'm about to say, but I'll say it anyway. Like, what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. Not what do I get out of it? Right. Not that, but like, what do you have for me that I could find that would make me closer to that goal of being healthy on the inside, healthy on the outside, you know? And I take that and I look at the people in the church and I go, I want that for them also. Mm -hmm. I want that for every single person to go, I'm not asking you to pledge your fealty to our church structure and like, because that's security, right? Mm -hmm. Security is numbers. If you want to know why people talk about like attendance and giving, hey, there's security wrapped up in that. I want to be willing to go, hey, those things matter. They, they matter. I mean, it, it helps us do the things that we do. But if we lose all those things and people start finding Jesus in that Ephesians 2, mm -hmm. I was lost and now I'm found sort of way, mm -hmm. I hope I wouldn't miss that in an effort to replace it with security or safety. Yeah, it, it almost makes you, uh, so when when we preached on Ephesians 2 um, recently, uh, it was wrapped up in a, you know how we do series and stuff, it was wrapped up in a series on hymns, um, and we, we preached, we talked about the hymn Amazing Grace, written by John Newton, and, and part of the sermon is going through the story of who John Newton was, and, um, and it, for him, it, I mean, crazy story. Just go look it up. It's, it's wild. I don't have time for it right now. Uh, but he gets to the point, his conversion point, it, it comes with the, a great storm. Um, and that's where he cries out to God. It almost like there's something inside of me, maybe inside of you that just like longs, like, God, just give me that storm to remind me that you're there, right. that it, to remind me of what the, it means to call out to you, to want you, because it's so easy to just do the work. Yeah. Yeah, to lose the awe of it. Yes. So you're a Texas person. I'm a Texas person. And that's in Texas, if people haven't been from there, every now and then you get a storm that comes through and you see it coming and it's so big and it's so powerful and it might have a tornado in it. You don't know. It mm -hmm. could be, it could be a hurricane. It's just Texas. You don't right. know. And you have this feeling of being very, very small. Like, hey, this, 
the magnitude and the awe and, and awe does this weird thing where you're scared of it and you want to get away from it, but you're in, you know, intrigued and you want to get near it. Um, and we don't live in those kind of storms here. You don't have those kind of storms here, but that's, that's what I want to experience in my relationship with God that I'm, I don't forget how big he is. I don't forget who he is and I'm fearful of what he might drag me through, but I'm intrigued by what he could take me to also. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get to a place where a boring 35 minute burnout treatment cycle mm -hmm. robs me of the storms of who Jesus is. Yeah. Well, to go back to Ephesians 2, man, uh, it says, so the first three verses is basically, uh, you're, you were this, or, or you are this, you're a sinner, uh, dead in your trespasses. And then you get to verse 4, and it's like, but God, right? right? Two, two of my favorite words in all of the Bible. Um, but if you keep reading, it, it says, but God, being rich in mercy, made us alive. I think that's the problem. We can still be in church and in even pastors and, and still be dead and still not be in alive, verse not one, awake. two, and three. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not awake. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to walk. I don't want to be another episode of The Walking Dead. Um, and it's, I'll be, be honest. I mean, we're online. It's painful. And stuff, it's but, painful how accurate The Walking Dead. They're, man, yes, that's exactly how it feels when you're in it, too. Mm -hmm. Of like, I, I, another day came and went. And what mm -hmm. happened? I, I don't, I don't know. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that's a that's an accurate way of describing The Walking Dead. Yeah, no, that's that, it's just like God, wake me up, open my eyes, and it's like, oh, I just long for that. And so I, I tell that story about um, the guy saying, you know, I'm looking forward to getting to know Jesus, because I don't want to wait until I'm 40 or 50 or 60 to have to retire from what I'm doing to get yeah. to know Jesus. What do I need to do to reorganize my life, um, to turn it upside down, even? to yeah. to have those moments where it's just me and him and um and so part of the answer to that for for us and for my family it's been counseling honestly um and it's been really really helpful to slow down uh, reading some some better books on slowing down has been really helpful um but it's hard man yeah. it's really hard to to get out of the malaise and the normality like we just it just feels like we're on the merry-go-round of normality. Right. Well, and I think, so I think that people go through, we're going to have to wrap this up and we're going to continue on a podcast here in a second. But I, I think if there's someone listening that understands what that feeling of like, like a midlife crisis of like, I, I would rather, it's kind of like, it's kind of like this weird internal, I think everybody's got this weird internal arson who's like, maybe we should just light it on fire and just right. see, because at least then something's happening, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's what a, a life on mission actually does. The healthier version of that is like, you know what? I was going to die anyway. Right. I'm eventually headed that way anyway. God, why not just, let's just, let's just figure it out now. I'll, I'll risk it. I'll risk it now because maybe by following you, I find out what life is instead of just feeling like this slow burden of daily death. So... We're gonna, if you're watching, we're gonna wrap this up. We're gonna do a podcast on this with no video. We're just gonna turn the mics on and talk about the PG-13 version of whatever it was you were referencing <laughs> a minute ago. So, uh, hey, man, uh, long overdue. I love that you live near us. I, I hope, I, I'm personally hoping this is something we can do again. Um, I appreciate you jumping on, thank you. Yeah, man, no, thanks for uh, for having me. Um, anybody watching, thanks for listening. I, I told Jordan I was gonna probably, maybe the most uncommon guest on uh, the podcast, but um, thanks for having me, man. Oh. Love you, buddy. Appreciate you.